Section 8 of Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. The Glamour of the Snow. Chapter 6. And at once into his mind passed the hush and softness of the snow, and yet with it a searching, crying wildness for the heights. He knew by some incalculable, swift instinct she would not meet him in the village street. It was not there amid crowding houses she would speak to him. Indeed, already she had disappeared, melted from view up the white vista of the moonlit road. Yonder, he divined, she waited where the highway narrowed abruptly into the mountain path beyond the chalets. It did not even occur to him to hesitate, mad though it seemed, and was, this sudden craving for the heights with her, at least for open spaces where the snow lay thick and fresh. It was too imperious to be denied. He does not remember going up to his room, putting the sweater over his evening clothes, and getting into the fur gauntlet gloves and the helmet cap of wool. Most certainly he has no recollection of fastening on his ski. He must have done it automatically. Some faculty of normal observation was in abeyance, as it were. His mind was out beyond the village, out with the snowy mountains and the moon. Henri de Fago, putting up the shutters over his café windows, saw him pass, and wondered mildly. Ah, oh, monsieur, qui fait du ski à cet air, il est anglais, done. He shrugged his shoulders as though a man had the right to choose his own way of death. And Martha Perotti, the hunchback wife of the shoemaker, looking by chance from her window, caught his figure moving swiftly up the road. She had other thoughts for she knew and believed the old traditions of the witches and snow-beings that steal the souls of men. She had even heard, t'was said, the dreaded synagogue pass roaring down the street at night, and now, as then, she hid her eyes. They've called to him, and he must go, she murmured, making the sign of the cross. But no one sought to stop him. Hibbert recalls only a single incident until he found himself beyond the houses, searching for her along the fringe of forest where the moonlight met the snow in a bewildering frieze of fantastic shadows. And the incident was simply this, that he remembered passing the church, catching the outline of its tower against the stars. He was aware of a faint sense of hesitation. A vague uneasiness came and went, jarred unpleasantly across the flow of his excited feelings, chilling exhilaration. He caught the instant's discord, dismissed it, and passed on. The seduction of the snow smothered the hint before he realized that it had brushed the skirts of warning. And then he saw her. She stood there waiting in a little clear space of shining snow, dressed all in white, part of the moonlight and the glistening background, her slender figure just discernible. I waited, for I knew you would come, the silvery little voice of windy beauty floated down to him. You had to come. I am ready, he answered. I knew it, too. The world of nature caught him to its heart in those few words. The wonder and the glory of the night and snow. Life leaped within him. The passion of his pagan soul exulted, rose in joy, flowed out to her. He neither reflected nor considered, but let himself go like the veriest schoolboy in the wildness of first love. Give me your hand, he cried. I'm coming. A little farther on, a little higher, came her delicious answer. Here it is too near the village and the church. And the words seemed wholly right and natural. He did not dream of questioning them. He understood that with this little touch of civilization in sight, the familiarity he suggested was impossible. Once out upon the open mountains, mid the freedom of huge slopes and towering peaks, the stars and moon to witness, and the wilderness of snow to watch, they could taste an innocence of happy intercourse, free from the dead conventions that imprison literal minds. He urged his pace, yet did not quite overtake her. The girl kept always just a little bit ahead of his best efforts 
and soon they left the trees behind and passed on to the enormous slopes of the sea of snow that rolled in mountainous terror and beauty to the stars. The wonder of the white world caught him away. Under the steady moonlight it was more than haunting. It was a living, white, bewildering power that deliciously confused the senses and laid a spell of wild perplexity upon the heart. It was a personality that cloaked and yet revealed itself through all this sheeted whiteness of snow. It rose, went with him, fled before, and followed after. Slowly it dropped lithe, gleaming arms about his neck, gathering him in. Certainly some soft persuasion coaxed his very soul, urging him ever forwards, upwards, on towards the higher icy slopes. Judgment and reason left their throne, it seemed, completely, as in the madness of intoxication. The girl, slim and seductive, kept always just ahead, so that he never quite came up with her. He saw the white enchantment of her face and figure, something that streamed about her neck, flying like a wreath of snow in the wind, and heard the alluring accents of her whispering voice that called from time to time, a little farther on, a little higher, then we'll run home together. Sometimes he saw her hand stretched out to find his own, but each time, just as he came up with her, he saw her still in front the hand and arm withdrawn, they took a gentle angle of ascent. The toil seemed nothing in this crystal wine-like air. Fatigue vanished. The sishing of the ski through the powdery surface of the snow was the only sound that broke the stillness. This, with his breathing and the rustle of her skirts, was all he heard. Cold moonshine, snow and silence held the world. The sky was black and the peaks beyond cut into it like frosted wedges of iron and steel. Far below the valley slept, the village long since hidden out of sight. He felt that he could never tire. The sound of the church clock rose from time to time, faintly through the air, more and more distant. Give me your hand. It's time now to turn back. Just one more slope, she laughed. That ridge above us. Then we'll make for home and her low voice mingled pleasantly with the purring of their ski. His own seemed harsh and ugly by comparison. But I've never come so high before. It's glorious, this world of silent snow and moonlight, and you. You're a child of the snow, I swear. Let me come up closer to see your face and touch your little hand. Her laughter answered him. Come on, a little higher. Here we're quite alone together. It's magnificent, he cried, but why did you hide away so long? I've looked and searched for you in vain ever since we skated. He was going to say ten days ago, but the accurate memory of time had gone from him. He was not sure whether it was days or years or minutes. His thoughts of earth were scattered and confused. You've looked for me in the wrong places, he heard her murmur just above him. You looked in places where I never go. Hotels and houses kill me. I avoid them. She laughed, a fine, shrill, windy little laugh. I loathe them, too. He stopped. The girl had suddenly come quite close. A breath of ice passed through his very soul. She had touched him. But this awful cold, he cried out sharply, this freezing cold that takes me. The wind is rising. It's a wind of ice. Come, let us turn. But when he plunged forward to hold her, or at least to look. The girl was gone again, and something in the way she stood there, a few feet beyond, and stared down into his eyes so steadfastly in silence, made him shiver. The moonlight was behind her, but in some odd way he could not focus sight upon her face, although so close. The gleam of eyes he caught, but all the rest seemed white and snowy, as though he looked beyond her, out into space. The sound of the church bell came up faintly from the valley, far below, and he counted the strokes. Five. A sudden, curious weakness seized him as he listened. Deep within it was, deadly, yet somehow sweet and hard to resist. He felt like sinking down upon the snow and lying there. They had been climbing for five hours. 
It was, of course, the warning of complete exhaustion. With a great effort he fought and overcame it. It passed away as suddenly as it came. We'll turn, he said with a decision he hardly felt. It will be dawn before we reach the village again. Come at once. It's time for home. The sense of exhilaration had utterly left him. An emotion that was akin to fear swept coldly through him. But her whispering answer turned it instantly to terror. A terror that gripped him horribly and turned him weak and unresisting. Our home is here. A burst of wild high laughter, loud and shrill, accompanied the words. It was like a whistling wind. The wind had risen, and clouds obscured the moon. A little higher, where we cannot hear the wicked bells, she cried, and for the first time seized him deliberately by the hand. She moved, was suddenly close against his face. Again she touched him. And Hibbert tried to turn away in escape and so trying, found for the first time that the power of the snow, that other power which does not exhilarate, but deadens effort, was upon him. The suffocating weakness that it brings to exhausted men, luring them to the sleep of death in her clinging soft embrace, lulling the will and conquering all desire for life, this was awfully upon him. His feet were heavy, and entangled he could not turn or move the girl stood in front of him very near he felt her chilly breath upon his cheeks her hair passed blindingly across his eyes and that icy wind came with her he saw her whiteness close again it seemed his sight passed through her into space as though she had no face her arms were round his neck she drew him softly downwards to his knees he sank he yielded utterly, he obeyed. Her weight was upon him, smothering, delicious. The snow was to his waist. She kissed him softly on the lips, the eyes, all over his face. And then she spoke his name in that voice of love and wonder, the voice that held the accent of two others, both taken over long ago by death, the voice of his mother and of the woman he had loved. He made one more feeble effort to resist, then realizing even while he struggled that this soft weight about his heart was sweeter than anything life could ever bring, he let his muscles relax and sank back into the soft oblivion of the covering snow. Her wintry kisses bore him into sleep. Chapter 7 They say that men who know the sleep of exhaustion in the snow find no awakening on the hither side of death the hours passed and the moon sank down below the white world's rim then suddenly there came a little crash upon his breast and neck and hibbert awoke he slowly turned bewildered heavy eyes upon the desolate mountains stared dizzily about him tried to rise at first his muscles would not act a numbing aching pain possessed him he uttered a long, thin cry for help, and heard its faintness swallowed by the wind, and then he understood vaguely why he was only warm, not dead, for this very wind that took his cry had built up a sheltering mound of driven snow against his body while he slept. Like a curving wave, it ran beside him. It was the breaking of its overtoppling edge that caused the crash, and the coldness of the mass against his neck that woke him. Dawn kissed the eastern sky. Pale gleams of gold shot every peak with splendor, but ice was in the air, and the dry and frozen snow blew like powder from the surface of the slopes. He saw the points of his ski projecting just below him. Then he remembered. It seems he had just strength enough to realize that could he but rise and stand, he might fly with terrific impetus towards the woods and village far beneath. The ski would carry him, but if he failed and fell, how he contrived it Hibbard never knew. This fear of death somehow called out his whole available reserve force. He rose slowly, balanced a moment, then taking the angle of an immense zigzag, started down the awful slopes like an arrow from a bow. 
and automatically the splendid muscles of the practiced skier and athlete saved and guided him, for he was hardly conscious of controlling either speed or direction. The snow stung face and eyes like fine steel shot. Ridge after ridge flew past. The summits raced across the sky. The valley leaped up with bounds to meet him. He scarcely felt the ground beneath his feet as the huge slopes and distance melted before the lightning speed of that descent from death to life. He took it in four mile-long zigzags, and it was the turning at each corner that nearly finished him, for then the strain of balancing taxed to the verge of collapse the remnants of his strength. Slopes that have taken hours to climb can be descended in a short half-hour on ski. But Hibbert had lost all count of time. Quite other thoughts and feelings mastered him in that wild, swift dropping through the air that was like the flight of a bird. For ever close upon his heels came following forms and voices with the whirling snow dust. He heard that little silvery voice of death and laughter at his back. Shrill and wild, with the whistling of the wind past his ears, he caught its pursuing tones, but in anger now, no longer soft and coaxing, and it was accompanied. She did not follow alone. It seemed a host of these flying figures of the snow chased madly just behind him. He felt them furiously smite his neck and cheeks, snatch at his hands, and try to entangle his feet and ski in drifts. His eyes they blinded, and they caught his breath away. The terror of the heights and snow and winter desolation urged him forward in the maddest race with death a human being ever knew, and so terrific was the speed that before the gold and crimson had left the summits to touch the ice lips of the lower glaciers, he saw the friendly forest far beneath swing up and welcome him. And it was then Moving slowly along the edge of the woods, he saw a light. A man was carrying it. A procession of human figures was passing in a dark line laboriously through the snow, and he heard the sound of chanting. Instinctively, without a second's hesitation, he changed his course. No longer flying at an angle as before, he pointed his ski straight down the mountainside. The dreadful steepness did not frighten him. He knew full well it meant a crashing tumble at the bottom, but he also knew it meant a doubling of his speed, with safety at the end. For though no definite thought passed through his mind, he understood that it was the village curé who carried that little gleaming lantern in the dawn, and that he was taking the host to a chalet on the lower slopes, to some peasant in extremis. He remembered her terror of the church and bells. She feared the holy symbols. There was one last wild cry in his ears as he started, a shriek of the wind before his face, and a rush of stinging snow against closed eyelids, and then he dropped through empty space. Speed took sight from him. It seemed he flew off the surface of the world. Indistinctly he recalls the murmur of men's voices, the touch of strong arms that lifted him, and the shooting pains as the ski were unfastened from the twisted ankle. For when he opened his eyes again to normal life, he found himself lying in his bed at the post office with the doctor at his side. But for years to come, the story of Mad Hibbert skiing at night is recounted in that mountain village. He went, it seems, up slopes and to a height that no man in his senses ever tried before. The tourists were agog about it for the rest of the season, and the very same day two of the bolder men went over the actual ground and photographed the slopes. Later, Hibbert saw these photographs. He noticed one curious thing about them, though he did not mention it to anyone. There was only a single track. End of the Glamour of the Snow